when we talk about biblically what the Bible uh, teaches us. Um, the very first few slides are a continuum of, of some of the why, but it's a visual. The visual is a little bit different. And then we'll, we'll move right from there into the actual material. Um, there's, we, we do not wish for you to try to write down everything because there's, we got too much to cover. Okay? We want you to capture the big picture. Uh, if you want to jot a phrase down periodically, but we don't have time to copy down everything on every slide. We'd be here until tomorrow. Okay? Um, and so uh, the biggest part is that this afternoon we're going to give you an overview of, of all the material. Uh, Pastor Young and I will pull chairs out later and we're going to do a role play for you for you to see it happen with this material. Then we're going to give you an opportunity to sit there and prepare as though you are going to lead a Timothy to put a bar showing you how to do it. You're going to have your books and you're going to study a little bit. And then we're going to match up men with men and women with women. And we're going to practice with each other. So you're going to get a chance to see it. You're going to get a chance to study it. You're going to get a chance to lead with it. And you're going to get a chance to be led with it. And then at the end, we'll say, okay, can we do this? Do you have any questions? But we want you to leave having really got your hands on it, okay? And then after we've done the call to joy, which will take us the longest time, because it's the most basic, it's the most basic, therefore there's a greater... Uh, responsibility that you have because this is a brand new Christian or someone who's never been discipled. And then when we move into the other book, A Call to Growth, uh, we give, we're giving them more responsibility now because everything is sort of gradually, uh, incrementally given to them. And you'll see how that all, all goes. So that's, that's sort of the picture that we're going to have. Uh, we got a lot to cover this afternoon. Uh, I'll, I'll probably talk fast, but if I say something you just totally didn't understand, stop me. Raise your hand and say, please repeat that. I will. I'll be happy to. You won't be interrupted. Okay? Uh, I used to tell my biology students sometimes when we were going to do something new, like really fun, you know, like photosynthesis or the life cycle of algae, you know, real exciting stuff, uh, <laughs> that uh, if, if, if uh, I said, we don't have much time, so I'm going to talk fast, you listen fast. Let's stop at the same time, and we'll probably be okay. And so that's what we're gonna we're gonna do here. Uh, we're gonna work through it, and when the dust settles, my prayer is that you'll have a good sense of how to use this material. The other thing you'll notice on your table is that you all have my business card, my email, and my cell phone number is on that card, and I welcome your your questions. When I'm in Texas, if you email me or you call me, um, I will help you with your stuff. Okay, your first person to call is your team. And then, but at the same time, if you can't get all them, you call me. Okay? Because they're going to be the ones that know more about this than anyone here, because they're going to be trained. We're going to talk about it a little bit more later. But I am available to you. Uh, I know Young would be happy to share his email with you if you have questions. We want to partner with you. We don't want to leave and just say, you know, get after it. We want to help you be successful with this. Okay. How to make disciples. Okay, the first thing I'd like you to do is read with me the, the mission statement of Operation Multiplication. So read this with me, please. Operation Multiplication's mission is to help the churches and the disciple makers to personally be friend and equip each new member with the needed ministry skills to enjoy a lifetime of spiritual growth and evangelistic multiplication. So we want to grow, but we also want to multiply. Okay, and it's to equip churches to train. Again, not just teach, but to train as, as we go. All right. Uh, read this, read this, uh, Matthew 28, 19 with me. Go and make disciples of all nations. Do you remember the definition that Dr. Hanks gave of a disciple? He said it was a disciplined learner. Okay? That's, our, that's what we want to do is go make disciplined learners who are healthy in their growth so they can what? Multiply. So they can reproduce. So that they can reach others who will reach others. See, that, that's somewhere where we stop. We reach people, but not to reach them, to teach them and train them to be better. That's where our goal is, one person at a time. New believers are like newborn babies. They need personal, special care. Right? Would you agree with that? Okay, is there a special place, picture in your mind, 
where you're from, uh, a park, a place that you can go with your family and have a picnic, throw the frisbee, relax, and just picture that, okay? So there you are in this park. You're going to have a good time with your family. But when you got there, this is what you found. On a bench, by itself, mm -hmm. a baby abandoned. Would that be okay? No. There's no adult around anywhere. An abandoned baby. Would you just go on and have your picnic? No. What would you do? You, you, you would get it. Do you get to keep it? No. No, but you're going to have to do what? Call the authorities. Somebody's in trouble. Somebody neglected a baby. That's pretty graphic, but if we think about it, it's sort of what we've done with new baby Christians for a long time. We've left them to fend for themselves. We say, no, 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 no. No, we invite them to church. And we invite them to come to Bible study. That's great. But they're babies. That would be like when my daughter was born. Me, me sitting her down when we got her home the first day and put her in the living room on the floor and say, Stacy, welcome. Welcome home. Let me tell you where things are. Uh, there's a bathroom in here. When you get a messy diaper, you crawl in there. You'll get the hang of it. Just make sure you flush the toilet. And, and when you get hungry, that could be a little dangerous, but there's a kitchen right over here. You need to get the milk out of that great big old thing, and then you pour it. But we're going to have to figure out how you're going to do that, but that, oh, that stove is really going to be dangerous. When you heat it up, uh, you, you'll figure it out. And in your bedroom, oh yeah, your bedroom's down the hall, this baby bed. I don't know how we're going to get you in that by itself. That's a high little... Well, again, you'll figure it out. You sort of watch, and you'll get a hang of it. But would that be crazy? Yeah. Here's what we've done, though, guys. Not on purpose, not because we're cold-hearted, because we haven't been there. Especially if we grew up in the church. And we say, oh yeah, there's a sanctuary, and you go in there, and that's where you'll hear good preaching, and they, they will. See? But they don't know, when do you sing, and when do you stand up, and when do you sit down? And what's this little plate coming with money in it, and we're supposed to put in or take out. I mean, they, they don't know. They don't know. And there's a Sunday school class down. What's a Sunday school class? Or a Bible study? What's the Bible? And we just start pointing them. And even if we have a new members class, which sometimes we do, there, what do we usually do there? Tell them about all the programs with the church that they don't understand. But even if we did a really good job <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I went to Mac and I said, Mac is a new Christian. You know what? I got a Bible study for you, man. Here. He says, Hey, thanks. You need to do it. Thanks. Oh, yeah, I got a Bible for you. Here. And I give him a Bible and a Bible study. That would be the best thing I could do. And then I tell him to go study it. I just gave him two books he doesn't know how to use. And he's going to go home and get frustrated. And Satan's going to have a heyday with me. Because he doesn't know how to use the Bible, he doesn't understand that question, and he doesn't know if the answer, what the answer is, is a trick question. And, and, and that's what we've been doing. Even if we did that last thing, that's the best thing we could do. We frustrated them. What you're going to learn today with this material, and I agree with Pastor Young, of all the things I've done in my 63 years, of all the Bible studies I've used, I could name every kind you can think of. Because I don't have a heart for disciple making. I've used really good stuff. There's no question that this is the most effective. Because you know what you do? When they first learn to do a call to joy, they will not do one Bible study in this book alone, ever. <clears throat> they will do Bible study when I'm with them. I'll be with Matt. We'll open our Bible. He can't get frustrated because I will be there to answer his questions. For seven sessions, it may take 10 or 12 weeks, we will do Bible study together. Okay? I don't know of any other study that does that. Alright? He will have things to do on his own, and you'll see that later. But you've got to get used to this material and the features in order to effectively use it. And so, 
that, we don't want this happening ever again. I just want you to know that this picture was taken in, in San Diego by our Vice President Obama and standing at the end of the bench right there, okay? And this is her, this is her in this next slide. And I want you to know too that our Thai in, our, in Thailand, we have retaken all these pictures. There's not a blonde-headed lady holding a baby. There's a Thai lady holding a baby. It's Young's wife. <laughs> okay. And 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 in the other pictures where you'll see Americans, you'll see Young and his son. And the other picture when you see people in a Bible study, you'll see Young and his family in Waco. <laughs> because what are we wanting to do? Contextualize this. We want this to be fit the culture in Thailand. And we're going to do everything we can make sure that, it's, that that culture is respected and they relate to that, to what we're doing. We're doing the same thing in Spanish and the same thing with their things. It's too important. Okay? So this is what you have now because the tie is still being worked on. But we're just supposed to be finished. But see, this is what a baby needs, isn't it? A baby needs personal care. He needs, needs a mama, a daddy. Read this with me. But we prove to be gentle among you as a nurse's mother and tenderly care for her own children. Oh, we're not going to be neglected at all. We're going to be loved. We're going to be encouraged. Right? But there is a verse that follows this one, 1 Thessalonians 2, 8, that I really wish we would have put on there with it. We have it. That's okay. We can talk about it. You know what verse 8 says? I'm going to summarize it. It says, because, Moses, because I care for you so much, I don't want to just share the gospel with you. I want to share my life with you. Because I care. That's what it says. Yes, I want to share the gospel, but not just the gospel, my very life. See, that's what a parent does. A parent shares their life with that baby. What would start happening? The two reasons people leave the church today, this is based on research. Number one, I never made a friend. I tried. But everybody already had their friends. And I never felt like, they don't even get mad, they just quit coming. But you don't notice them. They just don't come back. Or, and or, number two, I never found a place to serve. Why have you got 20 places to serve? Yeah, but nobody knew their gift and their heart because nobody would knew them like a friend. Oh, I know you're a male and you're this tall and you work for the post office. That's what I know. I don't know if you have the gift of service, the gift of teaching, the gift of administration, or I could help find you to that place to serve, to drive a van or to greet people or to something. What happens here is every time somebody gets matched up with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, guess what they get? A friend. Because you meet every week with them. You're going to pray with them, laugh with them, cry with them. They're going to become your friend. They like to be with their friend. That one, one thing is good. Matter of fact, in our church, at First Baptist Church in Belton, Texas, we call our ministry, we train them with Operation Multiplication. The name of our ministry is simple. Friendship Ministry. We have 116 now in our, our friendship ministry. We can match up with people. You know, some say, I'm glad you joined our church. We have somebody who would like to be your friend and walk with you and get to know you. We very seldom ever have anybody say, no, I don't want a friend. I don't want anybody to walk with me. They're welcome. If it's a couple, we get a couple, but they do it one-on-one, -on -one, a guy with a guy and a guy with a guy. Now they can hang out together, do other things, but one-on-one. -on -one. Men with men, women with women. We offer it to our new believers, and we offer it to our new members. Okay? The beautiful thing is our old members are now saying, why can't we do this? You can. And we match somebody up with them. Because most of our old members have never been to life. But we never make an announcement. We'll talk about that later too. New believers and new members need more than a handshake when they join our churches. People aren't looking for friendly churches. They're looking for friends at church. Big difference. 
new believers and members need a Christ-centered friend to walk along beside them and help them feel welcome to introduce them to new friends to answer their questions and no matter how silly the question is they never get laughed at they're never embarrassed it's just you and them the guy that, that discipled me years ago, he was a home builder. He, he, he didn't have a seminary degree, he didn't have a college degree, he built houses. And when I joined in 1977, I was 27 years old, when I joined that church that week, that man took me to a restaurant, bought me a cheeseburger and onion rings, and when the order, waitress went away, these were his words to me. And remember, I've never at that point had anybody pour their life into me. And he said these words. Coach, because I was a new baseball coach at the university. He said, Coach, I'm a home builder by trade, but I'm a man builder by call. And I would like the privilege of entrusting to you what someone entrusted to me years ago. Now, you know what that is? That's 2 Timothy 2.2. And trust to others was entrusted to you that they may teach other faithful men also. He said, and someday you'll do the same. Now, I didn't know about that same thing, but I knew that I was hungry for someone to walk with me. And that man took me under wing for a couple of years. He taught me how to make a hospital call because I would go watch him make hospital calls. He taught me how to share my faith. I watched him lead people to Christ. He never put me in a position to do anything I wasn't ready to do. But I watched. He would say things when I would ask a dumb question. I knew it was dumb. But he never made me feel dumb. Ever. And there's two things he would say when I'd ask a dumb question. You can use this. He'd say, Coach, that's interesting. He didn't say he agreed with it. That's interesting that you would say that. And then he would say, let's take a look and see what it says in the Bible. He never gave me answers that were his opinion. He said, let's see what the Bible says about it. And I would look at it and I'd go, wow. So I started learning the Bible is relevant to my life. And I learned how to minister the same way as he did. He would say things to me like, we'd leave. He'd, he'd, this is a man's man. I mean, he had calluses on his hands and drove a pickup truck. I'd get out of the truck and he'd say, coach, don't forget to pray for me. Okay. He said, I need the prayer and you need the practice. <laughs> I remember that to this day. William Thompson, this gentleman, was killed in a car wreck 25 years ago. In a hall. And I lost my spiritual day. He was the strongest influence in my life up to that day. His influence, my physical daddy, is 83 years old. Because William became my spiritual daddy, I had something to share with my physical daddy. I never heard my daddy say he loved me, ever. He was just a tough old guy. Cowboy, German Marine. Today, when I see my daddy, he runs up and hugs me. When I leave, he says, Bubba, I love you. You know why? William Thompson showed me how a man can love a man. And he told me, whether your daddy tells you he loves you or not, you tell him you love him. So I had the privilege of actually discipling my own dad. Why? Because a home builder, an ordinary man, not some educated, trained man. Somebody poured their life into me. So he poured his life into me. And I wasn't the only one. So all these years, I've been doing that. I didn't know any better. And then all of a sudden, I find these tools. <laughs> and all it did was take my ministry to a more effective place. Guys, Again, this is not a program. This is about relationships. 
and simple. The tool to use, the track to run on, to use for the rest of our life. And so we're going to answer their questions. We're going to equip them to grow spiritually on their own so that when we're finished spending our time with them, we're not finished in a relationship. It's just I'm cutting them loose and they go to somebody else. They know how to grow on their own. They're not dependent on me. It'd be like a parent that hovers so closely to their children they never grow up. It cripples their children. But they never learn to be an adult. See? Well, we can do the same thing spiritually. There's a point in time when I say, it's time to kick you out of the nest. Okay? they got to learn to grow spiritually on their own. That's, that's our job. Help them mature. When we become a Christian, and this is God's idea, okay, according to His Word, conviction of the Holy Spirit, what Jesus did on the cross, God's plan, when I become a Christian, then I have the foundation for all eternity on which to grow my life spiritually. As a matter of fact, read this verse with me. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. But here's the problem. Praise God that we have the gospel. Praise God that he gives us the foundation in Christ. It's all his idea. It's all his doing. We receive this gift. But what will they build upon that foundation? That's where we come in. That's where he allows us to come in. Yeah, he provides the foundation. But will this foundation be made, what will be built on it? Will it be wood and straw and hay that will disappear and rot away? Or will it be gold and silver and precious metals that will last? Which one? You're going to build something on it, right or wrong. Is that what's intended to be on that foundation? That's a dwelling. Somebody can live there. Okay? But is that what's intended to be on that foundation? No. A house is. But if he doesn't know any better, what's he going to put on it? I've got another picture where we put a tent on the, on the foundation. A tent's not supposed to be there either. A house is supposed to be over there. A healthy life.